purpose does the gentleman from Louisiana seek recognition? Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent to speak out of order for the purpose of announcing the schedule for next week. Without objection, the gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I also ask unanimous consent to revise and extend my remarks. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The House will meet next Monday at 12 noon for morning hour and 2 p.m. for legislative business. On Tuesday, the House will meet at 10 a.m. for legislative business. At 9 p.m., the House and Senate will assemble for a joint session to receive President Biden's address on the State of the Union. Members should be seated in the House chamber by 8.25 p.m. On Wednesday, the House will meet at 10 a.m. for morning hour and 12 p.m. for legislative business. On Thursday, the House will meet at 9 a.m. for legislative business, and we will be considering several bills under suspension of the rules during the week. The complete list of suspension bills has been posted on the clerk's website. Next week, the House is expected to consider a number of bills under rules H.R. 185 to terminate the requirement imposed by the director of CMS for proof of COVID-19 vaccination for foreign travelers and for other purposes. H.R. 185 rescinds the Biden administration's vaccine requirement on travelers who are coming to visit the United States. The House is also expected to consider H.J. Res 26, disapproving the District of Columbia's City Council Revised Criminal Code Act of 2021. Uh, H.J. Res 26 makes it clear that Congress does not approve of the City Council's radical decision to reduce penalties for a variety of crimes, including many violent crimes. Finally, we expect to consider H.J. Res 24, disapproving the action of the District of Columbia's City Council in approving the Local Resident Voting Rights Amendment Act of 2022. Uh, what this resolution would do is re reverse the decision by the D.C. Council that would allow illegal aliens to vote. As we all know, our southern border has been wide open under President Biden. Millions of people have come into our country illegally, and he continues to keep that border open. We've talked about bringing legislation to this floor, which we're working on in committee, to secure America's border. But in the meantime, the idea that allowing people that are here illegally to vote here uh, not only undermines one of our most sacred rights in the United States, but it also sends the wrong message to those who are seeking to come into our country illegally. We need President Biden to close the southern border, secure the southern border, get back to a legal process of immigration. That's what H.J. Res 24 would do. And with that, Mr. Speaker, I would be happy to yield to my friend, the new majority, the minority whip, of the House from Massachusetts, Ms. Clark. I thank the gentleman, and uh, it is my privilege to join my first colloquy uh, to stand here on behalf of the Democratic Caucus, and it is a pleasure to be with you, and thank you for the small promotion, however brief. And uh, I really do appreciate the insight into the week of head, although it does seem to have a very local flavor to it. And I have to express my dismay that once again, the House Republican majority is putting forward an agenda designed to score points rather than address the very real challenges faced by Americans. Next week, President Biden will return to this chamber for the State of the Union. And under his leadership, House Democrats have lowered costs We've created great paying union jobs, and we have made communities safer. We've spurred a period of renewed opportunity. 10.7 million new jobs, the lowest unemployment rate in half a century, and wage growth that is outpacing inflation. But that work has seemed to have ground to a halt. Here's what we've seen from the majority over the last month. The first bill of the 118th Congress was a bill that helps billionaires dodge their taxes and added $114 billion to the deficit. They continued their assault on reproductive freedom and are threatening economic disaster in order to cut Social Security and Medicare and filling our schedule 
with hollow symbolic stunts. The American people are in the GOP's rearview mirror. It's politics over people, plain and simple. And our constituents and the American people are seeing this. A recent national poll found that 73% of Americans say House Republicans haven't paid enough attention to the country's most important problems. The American people don't see themselves in the Republican agenda. And I would ask the majority leader, what does he say to them? Thank you and I yield back. Thank the gentlelady for yielding back. And what I would first th say to the American people is thank you for giving the Republicans the House majority to finally stop this mad rush towards socialism that we've seen in the last two years by the Biden administration. The taxing, the spending, the out of control policies that have led our country into one of the worst economic times we've ever seen. Inflation through the roof to the point where families can't even afford to put gasoline in their car. Inflation through the roof to the point where families can't even go to the grocery store and buy all the things that they would want. Uh, that's what the American people surely were fed up with. And the good news is, as I thank them for giving the Republicans the majority, which they did in the last election, Republicans have already gone to work delivering for those families. We've actually brought, it's interesting, you know, as the gentlelady talks about scoring points, we've scored a number of points for those American people to the point where we've actually had a number of Democrats vote with us. Um, the bills that were called partisan just two weeks ago, we brought a bill to the floor to say, on energy, the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, which is supposed to be America's security blanket in case that there's some major disruption with American energy supply. And I'm not talking about the disruption we've seen from, from President Biden's attack on American energy, which has been so severe that it's made our country dependent on foreign nations again, which is unconscionable when we can produce our own energy cleaner, better than anybody else in the world. But it said, if you're going to raid, Mr. President, that strategic petroleum reserve, you surely can't do it to sell it to China. And it was called partisan when we filed it. What's interesting is a majority of Democrats actually voted for that legislation, and it's now over in the Senate, and I hope it ends up on President Biden's desk. And I hope he signs it, but if he vetoes it, there was a veto-proof majority that passed that bill. We just brought a piece of legislation a few minutes ago onto the floor to reject the ills of socialism not just what we're seeing here in the United States, socialist movement that's been damaging to our economy, but all throughout time, so many examples of socialist dictators killing millions and millions of people. I'm glad to say a majority of Democrats joined with us to vote for that bill. Still a little bit shocking that 86 Democrats were not willing to stand up against the ills of socialism, uh, and that, that I would consider an extreme position, uh, but clearly there, there's still work to be done and the American people, I'm sure, will continue to engage their members of Congress on those issues. But we're going to continue to move policies to help families who are struggling. Energy policies, obviously, and there's more to come on that. The Energy and Commerce Committee just got constituted. They're working now on a good energy security package. The Natural Resources Committee and Transportation Committee are doing the same thing. Um, I had mentioned to the gentlelady earlier on the border, as we would like to see real security from our southern border. I hope President Biden, when he's speaking from the podium here in just a few days, will address that problem. More people have come into our country illegally under President Biden's watch than the entire population of the state of New Mexico. And where it's caused real damage is more than 100,000 young kids. Our young kids have died because of drug overdoses from drugs like fentanyl because the drug cartels of Mexico now have operational control of America's southern border. That's disgraceful. That's all brought on by President Biden's policies. He could end those today through executive action, reverse the things that he did that created the problem. He won't do that. So I do think it's important that this Congress take that action. We still wait for the president to do it on his own, but we're not going to stand by. We will take our own action and show the country how we can get a secure southern border. I hope that would be a bipartisan vote when we bring that to the floor, the 87,000 IRS agents. Uh, I don't know of any member of Congress, I'd love to hear from any of them, who've gotten phone calls from their constituents saying, please double the size of the IRS. Now what they have said is, please get federal employees back to work, because some people, I've got constituents that have been waiting two years for their tax return. 
and yet you've still got about half of the federal workforce that's working remotely, not coming into work. I've got veterans who call my office all the time who can't get their benefits that they earned. They showed up for work, by the way. They showed up and said, I'm going to go defend the rights of this country, and some of them got injured. Some of them are trying to get their benefits today and can't because some of those people working, getting their full salary uh, at the VA are not showing up for work. Uh, people that are waiting for passports to go visit loved ones overseas can't get their passports processed because some federal employees feel they should get their full salary but not show up for work. And so we brought a bill this week to say you should show up for work. Seems pretty basic. It's unfortunate that there were less than a handful of Democrats that joined with us to do that. So we're addressing the needs of those families who are struggling. Some of those votes have been bipartisan, some haven't. But we're going to continue to address them because they're bipartisan issues for America, even if they're not bipartisan in this chamber. And hopefully that improves over time. And I'd be happy to yield. To the gentlelady. I thank the gentleman. I am hearing the exact same rhetoric, the exact same political posturing that I've heard for the last month. It doesn't give the American people any reason to think the GOP's priorities are going to focus on them. Let's just look at what we were able to do as Democrats without a single Republican vote in the Inflation Reduction Act, true cost savings that went and started to go into effect this past month. We delivered a historic victory for seniors. We capped out-of-pocket drug costs at $2,000 a year. We limited insulin co-pays to $35 a month. We empowered Medicare to negotiate drug prices and we punished drug companies for predatory price hikes. Once again, every single Republican in the House voted against lowering seniors' pharmacy bills, lowering these costs for our Americans. A Republican member even asked, how are we going to undo that when we get into the majority? And here we are. The House Republicans' campaign platform took direct aim at this historic legislation. So we can vote on sham bills. We can look at what the D.C. City Council is doing. That is up to the majority to set that agenda. Our agenda is going to remain on lowering costs for Americans that the issues they talk around their kitchen tables and worry about are the issues we are going to remain focused on. And I would ask the majority leader, will you commit to defending these cost savings, these true victories for our seniors? I yield back. Thank the gentlelady for yielding. And the good news is we not only have already brought some bills to achieve cost savings, we're going to continue to bring bills to achieve cost savings. And one example, the gentlelady referred to a piece of legislation that deals with drug prices. And it was failed to mention that part of what that bill did was limit about 40% of the life-saving drugs uh, to come to market. We're already seeing right now a reduction in R&D and drugs being developed to cure new diseases because many of those countries that have government fixed pricing also don't have many of the life-saving drugs that America has because of that very policy. And so I'm curious to see which life-saving drugs they don't want to have on the market in America anymore. But you can go to Canada, you can go to France and see a long list, unfortunately, of drugs that you can't get in those countries that you can get in America that save lives every day. But that bill also raised taxes to the tune of over a trillion dollars on Americans. It raised spending to the tune of over a trillion dollars in America. That is increased inflation. The biggest concern I hear from families who want cost savings is stop the mad spending in Washington. That has not only caused them to have to pay more for everything they buy, it's literally taken a paycheck uh, a year, at least one month's pay a year out of their pockets because of all the spending we've seen in the last two years in Washington. So just stopping the spending, but also trying to get and rein in that. In fact, we brought a bill this week, uh, you know, we could talk about DC, we can talk about other places, but all across America, most Americans are saying, let's get back 
to our lives. Let's end this COVID emergency. And so we announced last week that we were going to bring a bill during this week to end the COVID emergency. What was interesting was after we took the lead, President Biden himself actually acknowledged that it does need to end. Now, he said he wants to wait until May to do it. And what's interesting about waiting until May is it allows the federal government to continue spending billions and billions of dollars under the guise of COVID on things that have absolutely nothing to do with COVID, like paying people not to work. Millions of people today are able-bodied, fully capable of working, and because of the waiving of things like welfare to work requirements, where people can right now get $25,000, $35,000 a year to sit at home and not work. Well, you know what that does? And we want to reverse that policy. If somebody's capable of working, they should be working. We believe in a safe social safety net for people. If somebody comes on hard times, that's why you have programs there. Uh, we are in America. If you want to stay at home and not work, that's your right. Just don't ask that hardworking taxpayer, the single mom who's working two jobs to pay for you to stay at home. What's even bigger in what President Biden has done by having these policies in place that pay millions of people to stay at home at work, you know what that does? That policy by President Biden undermines Social Security because those millions of people who our seniors are counting on to be in the workforce who are fully capable, being in the workforce, paying into Social Security so that those who work their whole lives and earn that benefit can have, and have a confidence that it'll be there for them. When you have millions of people being paid by the federal government to stay home, of course, it adds trillions to our deficit, but it also takes billions of dollars out of Social Security that we want to put back in. We want to shore up Social Security, but President Biden has undermined it with these policies that pay people not to work. So our bill said, let's end that immediately. Let's get those people back to work who are fully capable of working. Let's shore up Social Security immediately. We shouldn't have to wait more months and months like President Biden said he would want to do. And of course, if we didn't file that bill, he probably never would have wanted to end that emergency. So hopefully as we continue to lead, we'll see the president follow along. We welcome him to join us in saving this country and getting the country back on track. So we will continue to bring bills to address those many problems our country's facing. I yield back. I, I have to say I'm disappointed that it seemed like a simple question. Would you support the, the cap on insulin at $35 a month when one in four Americans with diabetes didn't take their medication because they simply couldn't afford them. But if the gentleman wants to talk about Social Security, I welcome that discussion. Um, it is clear that Speaker McCarthy, who was just at the White House yesterday, was talking with the President who underlined the urgency of responsibly raising the debt ceiling, something that Republicans did three times under President Trump. But instead, the majority seems more than ready to hold our economy hostage, to risk a global recession, to risk the full faith and credit of the United States, to gut those very programs, Social Security, Medicare, and to put more money in the pockets of the rich. They are using this debt ceiling as a smokescreen. So let's get the facts straight. This is not about new spending. This is about money we already owe. And if we want to go back to a place where Donald Trump really excelled, it was in driving up the deficit. Eight trillion dollars in four years under the Trump administration. That is a quarter of our entire debt ceiling. And again, when Donald Trump was in office, spiking our debt ceiling, the debt ceiling, uh, the deficit, the debt ceiling was raised three times without fanfare. Who benefits from that borrowing? The rich, the very rich, and the ultra-rich. Who do you think, if we don't pay this debt ceiling, is going to take over those payments? Apparently, you think it should be our seniors on Medicare and Social Security, families who are looking for affordable housing, our veterans, our children, our planet. 
you don't have to take it from me. The majority has made their position perfectly clear. One Republican member said the debt ceiling is an obvious leverage point. Another said the focus of budget cuts has got to be on entitlements. The Republicans' budget committee chair has called for eligibility reforms to Social Security and Medicare. The Republican study committee has openly proposed raising the retirement age to 70, handing Social Security accounts over to Wall Street, transitioning Medicare to a voucher system. All the while, when they actually are taking action, we're back to the rich, the very rich, and the super rich. First bill passed, adding to the deficit so that billionaires and the very wealthy can avoid, can avoid paying the taxes that we ask our teachers, our firefighters, our nurses to pay. And what's more, what's waiting on the agenda is a proposal to do away with the IRS. Let's do away with income tax and go to a system of a 30% sales tax. This would be devastating to families at home who are trying to put food on their table, a roof over their families, and have a basic quality of life. So I ask the majority leader, do you agree with your colleagues or will you join Democrats and keep our seniors and everyday Americans off the chopping block? I'll thank the gentlelady from yielding. And I earlier pointed out, I reject what President Biden did to undermine Social Security. So what we're going to be doing, and Speaker McCarthy brought this up to President Biden yesterday in talking about the debt ceiling, because frankly, I think most Americans have been hungry for us here in Washington to have the same adult conversation that they've been having at their kitchen tables for years, and that is how we can actually get spending under control in Washington. And so we've talked about the problems of paying people not to work. It not only adds to our deficit and debt, it also undermines Social Security. So let's get people back to work who are fully able-bodied. But why don't we talk about the nation's credit card? The debt ceiling is a symptom of Washington's spending problem. And so we are approaching in June, according to Treasury, the end of extraordinary measures where the nation would exceed its debt limit. And what that means for a family is families have credit cards. The credit card has a limit. It's a maximum amount you can spend. Now, many families would not like to spend up to that limit. Some like to pay their credit card off fully at the end of the month. Many don't have that luxury. And so they watch what the maximum is so that they know, okay, if I've got $300 before I hit it, I'm not going to spend 300 bucks because then the card will be declined. Well, if you max out the card, which President Biden has done with his last two years, $6 trillion minimum, those are the conservative estimates. Some estimates go as high as $10 trillion that President Biden has racked up on the nation's credit card. So the $31.3 trillion maximum on the nation's credit card has been hit by President Biden and the Democrat majority spending the last two years. Interestingly, when they were doing that spending, they didn't account for raising the cap on spending when they were spending the money. They pushed that off on us. And so now we have to confront this problem that they created. And so the conversation really should be focused on how we stop this from happening, how we stop maxing out the nation's credit card. Because if a family maxed out their credit card, of course they would pay the minimum payment. Of course they would pay the must-dos. Social Security, again, Speaker McCarthy has made it very clear, we are fully committed to supporting Social Security and those promises that have been made. Why is it that President Biden, the first thing he threatens is Social Security? A dollar's coming into the federal government. A dollar 29 is going out. That's the spending problem. If you really want to break it down to raw numbers, for every dollar the federal government takes in, it spends a dollar 29. Very few families sustain themselves on that kind of trajectory. So what we are saying is, why don't we try to figure out, Republicans and Democrats, and by the way, this shouldn't be a partisan exercise. Both sides should want to say, if a dollar's coming in, how do we make sure that only a dollar goes out? That's not where we are today. So let's have that conversation. It's a responsible conversation to have. But in the meantime, let's make sure we're paying our debts and talking about how we can make reforms so we don't keep maxing out the nation's credit card. 
That's what this debt ceiling discussion is about, because if we just give the president a blank check, which he asked for, and he's not going to get, nobody should just get a blank check. Give me more money so they can just go spend more money. That's not responsible. Let's figure out how we can stop the federal government from continuing to max out the nation's credit card. No better time to have that discussion than after President Biden has maxed out the nation's credit card. So we'll have that conversation. And I think we can get to an agreement where both sides come together and say, this is a problem we need to tackle together. Previous presidents have done that, Republican and Democrat, working with Congresses of the other party. I think we can have that conversation. And again, I think most of America has been saying it's about time Washington finally starts having that conversation because families have been having that conversation at their kitchen tables for decades and generations. And I'd yield. Uh, I thank the majority leader, um, but I have to disagree. Um, I think the majority is well aware that there is a big difference between our responsibilities around the debt ceiling and spending discussions. And what we have seen be brought together by all the quotes from Republicans laying out that this is their leverage point to cut spending for the basics for the American people. That are, those are your words, not the words of Democrats or President Biden. And I would completely disagree with this idea that maintaining our full faith and credit for things that we have already agreed on, that is not a blank check. That is not something that benefits President Biden. That is basic fiscal responsibility. And what we have here is a case of hostage taking. The willingness to risk global economic destruction, to put the full faith and credit of the United States in jeopardy, to be able to reduce investments we've made in the American people. What is it you would like to reduce? There is nothing we hear. And when we point out the majority's own words that it is entitlements we're coming after, now we're saying well, that's, that's not our goal. But let's look at what happened under our last Republican administration. Donald Trump tacked nearly $8 trillion onto our deficit. If that had not occurred, we would not even be at our debt ceiling right now. That would be coming in several years. And eight trillion on that deficit is a quarter of everything we owe. And when that was occurring, when the spending was going to the very wealthiest of Americans, when, this, when my colleagues were last in the majority, and Donald Trump would sign their bills, there was no mention of the debt ceiling. But now that we need to protect our seniors, those who are hungry in our communities, those who are still struggling to find health insurance, those who are needing to access security in their communities to find affordable housing, the investments that we're making in fighting climate change, building resiliency, and protecting our planet, when those things that don't affect the very wealthy and privileged, those are the things we're willing to put on the chopping block and use the full faith and credit of the United States as leverage that is a disservice to the American people and is the reason we are seeing polls like I previously cited the American people see they are not a part of the Republican agenda. This is about stunts, and it is about building the economy that works only for the very wealthy in this country. I would ask that the Republican uh, majority leader look beyond the constituencies of the very wealthy. And I hope that you will find in your agenda in the coming weeks, room for our seniors, room for our families, room for joining us 
in putting people over politics, making sure that we are working, continuing the work that we started in rebuilding our infrastructure, making an investment in jobs. We've created over a million jobs in the infrastructure bill every single year for the next 10 years. Those projects are going to be rolling out across this country. We've seen it already uh, with the president's trip to Cincinnati to make sure that we are not only rebuilding our roads and bridges and investing in the American people, but expanding broadband, creating great paying jobs, creating opportunity to help the American people. Sham bills, uh, using our full faith and credit, using the debt ceiling to continue to rig the system for the very wealthiest Americans, that's not what we're about. And I hope that we are going to begin to see an agenda from the GOP that has a glimmer of the American family reflected in it. General Lady, yield on that? I do. Thank you, because I appreciate you bringing up a number of the constituencies that we need to fight to help. Let's start with the people that have been struggling the most, the lower and middle income families. They've been struggling the most in the last two years. They thrived like never before during those Trump years that are being decried by the left. And why did we see such growth from lower and middle income families into the middle class, into higher income categories? Because we actually cut taxes so that we could be competitive as a nation again and create millions of jobs. We actually created millions of jobs by cutting taxes and making our country competitive and not keeping money in Washington, but actually freeing up power so that people could control their own destiny again. And those people did take control of their own destiny. Uh, again, we were losing our middle class during the Obama years. We were seeing great American companies leave America. You could get the list of them. And it's a long list, unfortunately. And we said, let's reverse that. Let's fight for those forgotten men and women. The millionaires and billionaires have their attorneys and their accountants and all the folks on the left who took care of those millionaires and billionaires, how about we start fighting for those people that had been left behind because they were being left behind. And so we said, let's make a tax code that's competitive for them. And if you go back and look, and the good news is there's real data now. You don't have to wonder about it. You know, you can throw away the talking points about the rich that are always thrown out there. The income groups that benefited the most from those tax cuts were the lower and middle income groups and millions of people became part of the middle class who were left behind. Those are the facts. The data is out there. Some people are angry about that because they still wanna live in this false universe where they just decry tax cuts because that takes power away from Washington. And I think that's what scares the left so much is when they see people being empowered again to be free to control their own destiny, not bureaucrats and autocrats in Washington taking their money and then telling them what they can get back telling them how high they can go. How about you break the ceilings and just let people go out and succeed and give them the tools to do it. And if you wanna go out and work and, and succeed and achieve the American dream, it's there for everybody. And we restored that again. By the way, some of those tax cuts expire. I hope the gentlelady and their side will join with us in continuing to keep that tax structure in place so those middle income folks can continue to grow and thrive but also for our seniors. And this is where the president, I think, is looking for ideas on how we can start living within our means again. And, and as I will refresh, as, as the gentlelady talked about, spending that's already been done and leverage and full faith and credit of the United States, none of that would even be a discussion point today if as the Democrats, when they had the House, Senate, and White House for two years and spent over $6 trillion of money we don't have, if they also would have addressed the debt ceiling at that time, we wouldn't be standing in this spot. We literally just took the majority weeks ago and the nation's already hit its debt ceiling because of the spending done, not by President Trump. He actually addressed the debt ceiling as we were putting policies in place that grew our economy and created a middle class again. That was already done. The last two years, over $6 trillion in spending, but no time seemed to be available to address the debt ceiling. So here we are and we're willing to have a discussion about how to get control over spending, but there are really good ideas. And in fact, many of these ideas will strengthen social security for our seniors. Uh, I talked a little bit earlier about getting people 
that are being paid not to work back into the workforce, that will strengthen Social Security. But how about we restore some of the work requirements that used to be there? And this goes back to Bill Clinton, a Democrat, who signed those work requirements. And again, it helped get more people into the workforce, helped give them a chance to achieve the American dream, but it also strengthened Social Security. When the government's paying people not to work, they're not paying into Social Security. That undermines the program. We should be wanting to strengthen it. By the way, there's also long lists, and believe me, we're going to be getting these lists out, and I hope Democrats will go down with this menu and say, okay, we agree. Paying people tens if not hundreds of billions of dollars to get tax credits who don't even have Social Security numbers, who don't even live in America. If, if a tax credit is there, it's there for people who pay taxes, not for people who manipulate the system because for whatever reason this administration won't even verify a Social Security number. Just doing that verification would save tens if not hundreds of billions of dollars. We're talking about real money. Those things could all help. And these aren't cuts to things, these are savings uh, for fraud. Real fraud, waste, and abuse that equals hundreds of billions of dollars. And we've been outlining these things. I haven't found any takers yet, but I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to give up. I think eventually we will get a lot of takers on the other side who will recognize this is something we all need to come together and do because there's no reason that the families who are hard, working hard should be paying for somebody else to cheat the system. And there's many, many examples. We'll continue to highlight them, and we'll actually bring bills to address those exact problems. And all of that should be a part of this discussion so we don't keep maxing out the nation's credit card. But again, nobody just says here, if their kids maxed out the card, they're not just gonna give them a new card and say, go max out the next one. They're gonna sit down and have an adult conversation about how you don't put the country in this situation again. I'd yield. Thank the gentleman for yielding. Let's get, go over the basic facts here, just briefly once again. What the House GOP did fight for in 2017 was a $2 trillion in tax giveaways for our largest corporations and for the wealthy, because that's who they work for, the rich, the very rich, and the super rich. And under the Trump administration, we had record job loss of 3 million jobs. So I, I am prepared to close if, if you are. And I, and I would just say on that, you can go look at the tax cuts. After those taxes were cut, the federal government took in more money than it's ever done in the history of the country because more people were working and more lower and middle income people were making higher wages lifting those at the bottom into the middle class, which was evaporating under the Obama years. So the data is very clear on that. And those tax cuts actually brought more money in to the federal treasury. Uh, anybody wants to dispute it, I challenge them to go to President Biden's treasury website and find the numbers because they're there. I'd yield back. The numbers are there, $8 trillion in deficit under the Trump administration direct correlation to a tax policy that only benefits the very wealthy. But I would like to, to close if the gentleman uh, yields for that. Happy and to I, yield for that. I thank him for joining me today. I look forward to many more conversations to come. In the meantime, our caucus is thrilled to welcome the president back to this chamber on Tuesday for a State of the Union address. And we hope the majority will draw some inspiration and work with us in service of the people who sent us here. Let's put people over politics, put them back on the table here in Congress. And with that, I yield back. And I thank the gentlelady for yielding and uh, enjoyed our first of many of these colloquies and uh, as we look towards hearing from the president, which we welcome together into this chamber, I look forward to working with the president to address these problems our country's facing so we can get the country back on track and then focus on, on the challenges ahead. There will be many more conversations we will have. And with that, Mr. Speaker, I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yield, yields